Um, we've got a wonderful speaker with us today. It is uh, Dr. Nasheed uh, Mayud, Mayun, um, from the Black Archives over at FAMU. Uh, so Dr. Nasheed, take it away. Yes, thank you, thank you. I'm glad to participate and uh, present the details of our facility and organization to the public so that uh, researchers and uh, family historians can know what we have to offer. All right, so as was mentioned, I'm Dr. Nasheed Madhu, and I'm director of the Meek Eton Southeastern Regional Black Archives Research Center and Museum. And that title is unique in that it shares the nuances of what this organization has to offer and what is it about. It is a federally designated location, one of 10 in the United States, to house black archives or archives and material related to the African diaspora as it's uh, important in the United States. Okay, so it is the Southeastern Regional Black Archives. So at some point, if you visit, you will see that some of the materials cover Georgia, South Carolina, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, and what have you. But for the most part, this institution uh, covers Florida and Florida A&M University, obviously because of access. Uh, but as years go by, we will collect more. It is located on Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. It has been open since 1971. Um, the hours of operation is uh, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. On Saturdays, noon to 4 p.m. Uh, and it's located at an address, 445 Gamble Street, and that's Florida A&M University. Uh, when you arrive, if you're looking to visit, uh, you can call ahead to the number shown on your screen, 850-599-3020, and you can reserve two, one of two spots right at that 445 Gamble Street location. Uh, when you arrive, you'll see cones in front of the building, and those cones uh, monitor or provide access to two spaces dedicated for visitors to the museum and archives okay and we can provide uh monitoring and access if you have a party that's more than that then there is a number at the bottom of that website screen um 850-561-2205 um, for larger groups all right so this organization is unique in that its primary purpose uh in the beginning was to begin to collect memorabilia as i stated before in 1971, there were a series of desegregation laws, and it was felt by history professors on this campus that there's a chance that some of that history could be lost. It was not designated at that time as a, a federal uh, repository, uh, but just simply as a place to collect memorabilia, papers, letters, and what have you. Okay, The history of the initial building is important as well. The building uh, comprises two distinct uh, separate entities. Um, the first building is a historic building on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, it's the Carnegie Library originally. It was built in 1907. Um, it has a classical revival style structure. Um, in 1905, the city of Tallahassee had the opportunity to uh, erect uh, a library open to the public, and that would mean open to all races. Uh, they refused that opportunity, and after a fire on campus, on the university campus here, uh, the officials sought their way to visit Andrew Carnegie and the foundation to see if that opportunity still existed to get this $10,000 to build uh, a structure to provide uh, library and access and uh, materials. It was approved. The building was open in 1907 and served as a library uh, until uh, the late 1960s. All right. So with that, as I move forward and the description of what this facility has to offer, 
uh, I would like to share that this is a flexible format. So if you have questions, you can type those questions or speak your questions, and I will stop and answering. If we had a larger crowd, I would say let's wait to the end. But um, Ms. Jones, Blake Robinson, and Jamie Bozio and Marva Coward, feel free to jump in and ask questions for clarity uh, because there's a lot of information that I will try to pack in to uh, um, a window here. Now, the museum on campus has 13 galleries open to the public. And these galleries are what we refer to as quasi-permanent. They're permanent, but they, um, uh, they're organic and reflect the materials in our repository. So you would have galleries that, and I will give descriptions so that you can understand for your research purposes. We have galleries that cover uh, the history of the presidents, uh, the uh, African Americans in the military, African Americans in civil service and public service, um, the band that's on campus, the Marching 100, uh, sports, African Americans in sports, African Americans in life and culture, um, church backgrounds, uh, preachers or what have you, Jim Crow in segregation, African Americans in medicine and science, uh, we have an African art gallery and some special collections, the Kinsey Collection, uh, Bernard and Shirley Kinsey Collection, and the Montague Collection. Uh, these are specialty collections that uh, would be nice to see, but not necessarily relevant to any genealogical uh, research. African Americans in music and entertainment, um, and then um, archives that are not necessarily in circulation, uh, and I'll speak to those shortly. But to begin, um, I will start with the FAMU Presidential Gallery. Now, the materials in that gallery reflect letters and correspondence from uh, presidents to staff, um, maybe correspondence or activities, major accomplishments, newspaper articles, publications, books by either the professors or the uh, presidents themselves during that era. So we present a reflection of our archives there and the major errors of course the university was founded in uh, 1887 and that reflects a major political movement in the United States uh, land-grant universities were able to be erected as a result of accumulated funds uh, for teaching agricultural purposes but the issue at that time was black codes and segregation, uh, separate but equal, and the presidents at that time, Thomas DeSalle Tucker uh, and Thomas Van Gibbs, were able to make sure that funding came to FAMU to erect this university. And so you get information about that. Uh, the next era of presidents important would be Nathan B. Young that served as president between 1901 and 1923. And I talk a little bit about his era. There was a FAMU hospital uh, from 1951 to 1971, but in 1901 to 1923, uh, specifically 1911, the sanitarium opened as a part of the nursing program, a nursing school that eventually emerged to become this FAMU hospital. So I talk about the, some of the records that you can find there. Um, there was a period of time when the university uh, had to maintain its autonomy. There was some conflict between FAMU and FSU, a possible merger. There is a merger between the engineering programs, but some of that is reflected. And if you have family members that uh, were here during that time, or were administrators during that time, then there's some information that may be helpful, correspondence or what have you. So moving forward, one of the more progressive periods of FAMU's history and uh, a, a major part of the presidential collection would be Frederick Hutt Humphrey's period, 1985 to 2001. He was a prolific writer and correspondent uh, to students, family members, uh, uh, parents of students, and staff. And so we have a lot of documents related to his tenure. And so that era um, would be uh, significant uh, if you're looking to 
gain access to information there. Okay, so that's that gallery. We track all the presidents and their major accomplishments, and we maintain every time a president leaves the university, we maintain their correspondence and documents, and we try our best to make available those that those documents that are deemed, um, I guess, most interesting or beneficial. But there, right now, there are no documents to be specific, no documents that are off limits so far. All right. The next would be the African Americans in the military. There was a significant ROTC presence on campus. A lot of um, um, students either came from World War One, World War Two, and begin and came to the university, or vice versa, left the university, went into the military, participated in ROTC, and so we reflect that. And we, because of that, we are we're able to reflect uh, activity in several major engagements. Uh, uh, Spanish-American War, World War One, Two, Korean War, uh, the Middle Eastern engagements. We've had uniforms, uh, letters, documents, medals, uh, memorabilia. Um, a very large collection that we rotate in that gallery. We have what we refer to as the Joe Lane Kershaw Family Anna Room, and that's a unique name. But when you see that again, uh, it reflects the. Um, political and civic service, civil service engagements of individuals who either helped the university or individuals who um, went to school here and participated in significant engagements. More, most importantly, uh, if you're familiar with 1956, the civil rights movement, and you were wondering if a family member participated in some of that, um, you know, the, you may recognize the names Wilhelmina Jakes, and Carrie Patterson, who sparked that 1956 Tallahassee bus boycott, um, we have pictures related to that and uh, correspondence and records of participation uh, related to that era. So there are other individuals, as I mentioned, uh, Jolene Kershaw, Carrie Meeks, Representative Gwen Cherry, who um, helped the university uh, in some ways with more particularly, the museum on campus gained funding, federal funding in the 1970s and 80s um, to usher in this designation as a federal repository. The new building that's attached to the building I mentioned earlier, the Carnegie Library, uh, opened in the mid-2000, 2007, uh, three floors, and that's how we're able to house these 13 galleries. And so their correspondence and information is represented there as well. Okay, um, we have um, on campus, uh, if you're familiar with HBCUs, there is a uh, cultural element through their band. And the band competes, uh, give scholarships to students, and um, travel around the United States uh, and the world, some of the bands. And the Marching 100 is the designation for uh, this band, uh, their branding. And it the students um, continue to communicate with each other uh, far beyond the matriculation at the university. Um, they performed with Prince, uh, Barack Obama, Kennedy Center. Um, it's considered one of the greatest, at some point, the greatest HBCU band in the United States. And their records, uh, pictures, uh, correspondence, and books are um, in our archives. So researching students or family members that participate in the band, uh, we have a large collection. Uh, one of our largest collections are reflected there. The next will, uh, exhibit will be African Americans and life and culture. This is a unique collection in that we combine uh, and represent a story that is unique to African Americans as they move through from slavery to the civil rights and that the church was a central part of that navigation in communication, uh, education, and also um, public life. And so we present uh, those stories. Those stories are collected through uh, sermons, um, some independent research, and the involvement of some preachers and uh, the civil rights or fraternal organizations, uh, Masonic organizations as well. And so the church 
is represented almost as authentic as an actual church from uh, the 1920s or 30s, but then you will see that artifacts and memorabilia are represented as well. Now, next is a very special collection, um, the uh, FAMU Sports Collection. The FAMU Sports Collection is unique in that one of the most famous um, coaches and um, sports administrators, Jake Gaither, uh, worked here at FAMU. So during the late 19th and 20th century, Jim Crow and segregation laws um, were etched into the southern states' constitutions. And these laws prevented African Americans from utilizing the same resources uh, as white co counterparts. And so a lot of major athletes went to HBCUs. Jay Gaither was extremely successful as the head coach and athletic director. He had access to all of these wonderful athletes and became very successful to the point where his style of coaching, his style of coaching uh, became a platform for other coaches. Uh, Chuck Mather of the University of Kansas, Frank Broyles of Georgia Tech, um, Vera Bryant, uh, Woody Hayes, um, and I mention those names because we have an extensive collection of correspondence uh, between these coaches um, and Jake Gaither, as, as well as Jake Gaither and students. So we've printed articles related to some of these documents, and they're very intriguing in that Jake Gaither took it upon himself to write parents and students to bring them on board to the university and after. So. Uh, you will see correspondence between uh, Jay Gaither and heads of football coaches to the point where there was one letter from the New England Patriots coach that says when Jay Gaither won his historic 200th win, uh, it is not a red, white, or blue thing. Uh, it is not a black and white thing. It's a red, white, and blue thing. Um, congratulations. And he had correspondence from Green Bay Packers and the Chicago Bears. And, of course, um, one of the – uh, players, uh, Bob Hayes, was an Olympian and went to the Dallas Cowboys. So we have correspondence there. So if your family member participated in some way uh, in the uh, football program, basketball program, or track program, uh, we have cataloged uh, these materials, and you may be interested in gaining access there. Okay. Um, now, I mentioned the FAMU Hospital, and that is unique in that, uh, you know, I mentioned 19th and 20th century segregation issues. Um, so, as you can imagine, African Americans had to find a way to get health care, uh, whether it's uh, basic or advanced health care, uh, where they could not find it in, for general means. And FAMU Hospital, um, what well, sanitarium opened in 1911 under President Nathan B. Young's administration. Um, it had 19 beds and supported the development of the nursing school. Um, the nursing school this raised money in 1949 uh, to open an actual hospital or healthcare center in 1951. So there are some records that are reflected. We have some instruments, um, we have some chairs, some books, some documents. Uh, to reflect that tenure of the hospital from 1951 to 1971. It closed due to desegregation laws. Uh, and so that affected, that point in 1971 affected both the sports program as well as the um, um, the hospital program. So um, that could be very interesting. And we have started to collect oral histories of uh, individuals who either had children born there or actually they themselves were born there. And uh, we do have um, faculty members and employees on campus that were born in this hospital, including um, Henry Lewis, an interim president, who um, we recorded his participation in the hospital and going there, uh, what have you. So that could be very interesting to you as well. All right. When you come to the Black Archives, um, of course, ink pens are not used. You need to contact Dr. Muriel 
Doss, Dawson. She's on the third floor, and she is responsible for maintaining the collections and finding aids and providing access and communication. You can actually call that number that we shared earlier. Um, you can call the number that we shared earlier, 850-599-3020, and contact Dr. Dawson directly to see if some of the materials that you're looking for are available so that your trip, you know, you can save time, you can have time on task. Um, and she will provide a space so that the material can be available for you, for you to peruse and, and go from there. Now, specifically to specifically to genealogy, we do have a couple of collections that may be of some help. If you had a family member that attended FAMU, um, 1958 to 1987, and 1995 to the present, we have all the yearbooks and commencement programs related to those years. And so you can uh, verify their matriculation periods and maybe get a picture of their participation in um, different groups and activities on campus. And that could help with your family histories. Okay, now we do have, uh, as I mentioned, the commencement programs. We have commencement programs dating back to 1940, to the present day. Commencement programs dating back to 1940, to the present day. We have uh, theses and dissertations, the College of Education and Nursing, dating back to the 1930s. Okay, so that could be helpful in seeing um, what some of your family members may have produced and how they uh, participated on campus. If you had a family, FAMU, um, if you had a family member that was a part of FAMU's administration, we have uh, directories, uh, uh, specific school directories and college campus overall directories dating back to 1950 dating back to 1950. So um, you and these directories include pictures. And, all right, pictures, roles, titles. All right, so that is uh, the major summary of the different collections that we have. Um, and it drives our galleries. Uh, we change those out. Um, so now I'm open to questions. If you have any questions specific to any of those galleries or uh, materials that I've uh, illustrated. Um, we do have a couple of questions that came in. Uh, it looks like somebody's looking at the collections page of your website. Um, when it comes to the African American and Central Life Insurance Company collection, um, do you know how far that collection goes back? Okay, the uh, insurance company collection does go back to the 1940s. Okay, and is that have a geographic scope? The geographic scope is southern Georgia and northern Florida. Uh, that would be Jacksonville over to uh, Pensacola. Okay, um, and are there any sort of restrictions for accessing that collection? Uh, I would say just call ahead. There are no restrictions um, as far as um, you know getting names and details. Um, if you need to make copies, there are general fees, but no real restrictions. Okay, thank you. Um, and we've got another one uh, for your Black Church collection. Does this collection contain any church minutes, baptismal records, or tithing records? that might help a researcher pinpoint the presence of a specific ancestor? Okay, so we don't have, uh, well, I have, uh, I guess, good news and bad news. We don't have minutes related to the churches, but do, we do have an ongoing research project for black churches in the region, uh, they, they, the, and we are starting to amass collections. So we do have access to some of the churches and their administrations, and we're helping them to organize their collections so that they can be housed here. And right now we have about uh, 25 churches in this immediate region, Florida, uh, Leon and Gaston County, um, dating back to the 1850s. And some of these churches were on plantations and they merged in, with other churches. And so we've been working since March of this year to help them organize uh, there are meeting minutes and um, sermons and what have you, their documents, so that they can have copies for themselves, 
but also be housed here. So if there's a specific church you're interested in, I would suggest you call ahead and ask to speak to uh, Reginald Weatherspoon. Reginald Weatherspoon. And he is the gentleman who's been uh, heading up that research project. And he will be very helpful. Okay. Are you guys um, digitizing some of that collection as well? We will be. We will be digitizing. We have two uh, grant applications out, and we have a request in for the new fiscal budget to uh, help us digitize that collection. Um, the Jake Gaither collection has been, the uh, majority of those papers have been digitized, and we have, a, we have an ongoing digitization process. We have over 10 million documents, so that's going to take a while. But as requests come in, and popularity of some of our collections come in, then we shift, we're able to shift our focus to suit needs. Fantastic. Um, still going through that page, apparently. Um, with the Black Archives obituary collection, which communities are included in this collection and about how far back does it go? So there are some from the 1930s, but uh, the Black Archives, uh, the obituary collection, uh, is relegated to uh, the Jefferson, Gaston, Leon County, this uh, Tallahassee region. Uh, I don't remember anything from southern Georgia or southern Alabama. I'm pretty sure it's, ma it's majority of this northern Florida area. Awesome. Um, and we're seeing here that you've got the Florida State Teachers Association, uh, Congress of Colored Parents and Teachers Association uh, type records. Do those records include like individual members listing? Yes, okay. They'd be individual members, uh, their contributions, some papers they've written, some newsletters. Um, uh, there are some minutes. Um, there are some, um, and as I mentioned, the education collection, there are some PCs and dissertations as well. And so that education project uh, was completed some time ago. It has not been digitized. Uh, so you would need to call ahead with any specific requests so we can make those materials available. Um, it is not um, a common request, but uh, we can make that available. Okay. Um, do you guys have copies of either digitally or microfilmed of the Freedmen Bureau collection? Okay, so we do not have... Um, I would say if you're interested in Freedmen Bureau information, there is a professor on uh, campus, uh, Titus Brown. He is over the public history program. He has a massive collection of Freedmen Bureau's records and documents. Um, he is a partner with um, the Black Archives, but we do not house his collection here, but uh, he is a good partner. Okay. And as a matter of fact, um, as a anecdote here, the, the Union Bank facility downtown that we um, present African American art was actually at one point one of the 19 Freedmen Bureau's banks. Oh, okay. Wow. And, and you can go to the Library of Congress, you can go online and access uh, a lot of those Freedmen Bureau's records. They're, they've been digitized. Wonderful. So if someone is interested in that specifically, uh, I, I suggest just send me an email, Nashid, N-A-S-H-I-D, dot Maduin, M-A-D-Y-U-N, at FAMU, F-A-M-U, dot E-D-U, and I'll send you some links. And there, matter of fact, I think I wrote a summary on some of those uh, uh, documents um, about a year and a half ago, and I could help you with that. Well, thank you so much. Um, does the archive provide any finding aids or research guide about each of the collections and how uh, they might conduct geneal genealogical research within those collections? Okay, so there are no finding aids online. Uh, we are uh, planning to launch a new website in uh, February. Hopefully, we're able to put those finding aids up. As you noticed, this current website does not have any drop down PDF tabs and so we have we do have finding aids. Uh if you call uh Dr. Dawson and request uh a summary of different collections, she can provide that. Oh, thank you so much. That's wonderful. 
Um, do we have any other questions that have come up at this time? Doesn't look like it right now. If you've got questions, you can type them into chat or you can raise your hand and we will uh, get you unmuted if you've got any questions. All right, I'm not seeing any at this time. Thank you, Dr. Nasheed. You were wonderful. Uh, I was more than happy to participate. I had a great time, and hopefully I helped some people. And if you have any further questions after uh, this uh, uh, webinar, uh, you have my email. Feel free to shoot me an email, and I'll be happy to see if I can answer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nasheed. Um, we really appreciate you being on with us and sharing your resources. Um, I think you guys have a fantastic collection, and it's great to help people get access to it. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you.